Silver was down over 50% a couple of weeks ago, and gold was making all-time highs. They don't have to move together, but they often have over the long term. So if gold is at an all-time high, it seems to me that silver is going to make an all-time too eventually. So it was just cheaper. So I bought some more silver. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, the CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, the host of this conversation. Really looking forward to this one because it is with our good friend Jim Rogers. He's coming back. We spoke with him just bare, just a few days ahead of Christmas. And of course, a lot has happened since. The Fed has calmed down. The world has changed, meaning gold and silver have moved. Geopolitics is getting more tense. Uh, we've just chatted briefly off uh, off camera. There was a big defense minister conference in, in Singapore just last week. Uh, a lot of sable rattling, quite a few aggressive notes coming out of China and other countries as well. So we'll have to catch up on what the world looks like these days. And of course, how is it impacting financial markets? I'm really looking forward to switching over to my guest here in a second. But before I do that, quick teaser. Hit that like and subscribe button. We tremendously appreciate it. It helps us reach a wider audience and bring guests like Jim on the channel. Thank you so much. Now, without much further ado, Jim, it is great to have you back on the channel. It's good to see you. I'm delighted to be here, Guy. I hope the world doesn't come to an end before the show is over. Yeah, we got about 30 minutes, so let's, uh, let's make it snappy. Okay. I think we'll make it. I think we'll make it. Uh, it, it is getting more tense and hostile out there, sadly. And uh, maybe we'll we'll start with the geopolitics, Jim. Uh, let, let, let's start with what have you been ex observing over the last three, maybe six months here um, in, in the world, and how is that impacting financial markets? Well, if you look out the window, you'll see that there's war going on and there's saber rattling, and Washington seems to want more war. There was a study done recently that shows America has been a country since 1776, in all but 19 years, America has been at war with somebody. The people in Washington seem to like war. We're not so good at it anymore, but they like it. I don't, but they seem to. So be careful. Be worried. Yeah, a lot, a lot, lots going on. A lot of hot spots. Like I think we can focus on three main ones. We have China and Taiwan. We have the Middle East, meaning Israel-Iran conflict with Hamas, and then of course Russia-Ukraine, which I think is the one that is being the hottest right now, with the EU and the US allowing Ukraine to use their Western weapons to attack Russia directly, which was forbidden until recently. How do you sort of weigh that? Like, what are your thoughts on that, Jim? Well, if you look back at First World War, Second World, or lots of previous wars. They often start with small wars. You know, there's a small war here and then a small war there. And the next thing you know, these small wars have turned into a big war. Unfortunately, what's going on now looks a lot like previous periods in history. I hope not. But it looks as though somebody is leading us up to a war, a real shooting war, not just a trade war, but a real shooting war. And it's not going to be good for anybody. No, definitely not. And uh, as I said, it is getting more hostile. I feel, I'm feel i starting to feel less comfortable in, in my own skin here. And uh, I had Simon Hunt on. I'm sure if you're familiar with his work. Uh, I had him on the channel here earlier this week. And uh, he sort of predicted or thought there might be a, a, um, an attack against a NATO member country by Russia very soon. And that has me worried because I'm not sure what the retaliation would look like. Well, if Russia attacks a NATO member, what it's supposed to mean is big, big, big war because the NATO treaty says, okay, if one of you gets hit, we all get hit, and we're going to join in. Now, I don't know if they'll do it. I don't know if they mean it, but that's what the treaty says. 100%. And uh, let's hope it doesn't come to that, Jim. Um, while, while the geopolitical landscape is changing dramatically and seems like ever, like ever faster, monetary and fiscal policy and landscape hasn't really changed that much since we last spoke. Yes, the Fed has been extremely dovish last time we spoke. The Jerome Powell said there might be three rate cuts. So far, we have not seen them. We're now early June here, June 5th, as we're recording this. No rate cuts. The market has calmed down. Uh, maybe one rate cut in September, but we're not sure about that. What, what, are, what are you witnessing on the fiscal and monetary side? It seems like the status quo hasn't changed. Well, most economies around the world are doing okay. I mean, nobody, very few people, if anybody's really suffering these days. So there's no reason to cut rates. If the central banks mean what they say, they're supposed to step in when there's a serious problem and help. But 
unless there's something going on I don't know about, there are very few countries, if any, that have a serious economic problem right now. Most people are doing fine. So there's no reason for bureaucrats to cut rates. That doesn't mean they won't, Kai. That doesn't mean it at all, I assure you. But from what I can read, there's no reason. Well, we've all been predicting a global recession for at least 2023 and maybe early parts of 2024. Again, we're sitting here in June. There's no recession in sight. Yes, there might be one that is that is not talked about, but officially there is no recession. And uh, we, we have to sort of analyze a little bit, Jim. Why, why is that the case? You just mentioned the global economy seem to be doing fine. Um, they're not exuberant or anything like G GDP growth rates are 1.3% in the US, for example. But uh, why is there no recession that everybody's been calling for? But before my guest answers the question, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Caliber Mining. Caliber Mining is an emerging mid-tier gold producer. Their portfolio of high-quality assets across the Americas includes a new exciting mine in Newfoundland, Canada, expected to be in production in Q2 2025, driving them to mid-tier gold producer status. The Valentine Gold Mine in Newfoundland will add about 195,000 ounces of annual gold production to the portfolio. Caliber is an exciting and emerging mid-tier gold producer with annual production profile of about 275,000 to 300,000 ounces of gold in 2024. The all-in production cost per ounce of gold is calculated and guided by the company to come in around 1375 per ounce, meaning Caliber is operating at a margin of about $1,000 US. What sets Caliber mining further apart is their commitment to ethical practices and community engagement. They ensure their operations are profitable while also being environmentally and socially responsible. I've personally known the Caliber management team for over 10 years. Back when I wrote my own newsletter called Dust Investor Magazine, their predecessor company, New Market Gold, was one of my top stock picks and later got bought out by Kirkland Lake Gold for over a billion dollars. I've been following Caliber Mining's progress and I'm genuinely impressed with constant ability to deliver and grow the company. It's a stock that aligns really well with the values we discuss on our show. So if you're looking to invest in a company that's leading the way in responsible gold mining, check out Caliber Mining, trading with the symbol CXB on the Toronto Stock Exchange and under the symbol CXBMF on the OTCQX in the US. You can learn more about their projects and initiatives by visiting their website at www.calibermining.com. Again, that's calibermining.com. Thanks to Caliber Mining for supporting our podcast and helping us bring you more great content. Now, let's jump back into the conversation. Well, most central banks in the world have printed huge amounts of money in the last few years. That's why there's no recession. Everybody, including China, has printed a lot of money. And if you, guy, if you give me a trillion dollars, I'll show you a very good time. Oh my gosh, we can have a good time. So you give me half a trillion and we'll have it. And that's what's going on. All these guys have printed staggering amounts of money. It's floating around and it's got to go somewhere. And so economies are having a good time at the moment. Now, we, we talked about the U.S. debt levels or global debt levels, Chinese debt levels as well. Uh, they have yet to hit a wall like as I said, like earlier, like it seems like the waters have come down a little bit on the debt discussions on the on the monetary side as well. Like, where where do you see the wall? Like, when do you see the wall or us hitting the wall? Us meaning the U.S. and China eventually hitting the wall. When do you see that happening? Well, that's a brilliant question. If you sit and look at the numbers and get out a pencil and a piece of paper, you'll realize that the U.S. cannot cannot pay these debts. Not even my children. I mean, I certainly I'm old, so I don't have to worry too much. But not even my children can pay the debt. It's so staggering. But at the moment, the central bank in Washington just keeps printing money and papering over the problem. I don't know when somebody's going to wake up one day and say, wait a minute, this is madness. Let's get out of here. It's coming. I know it's coming. I can start to see the signs, you know, that people, some people are getting worried. Some people are getting terribly exuberant. That always happens at the end of a long bull market. Everybody gets happy. Everybody thinks it'll never end. I can see the dangerous kinds coming, but I'm not selling short yet. It's too much money around. Oh, you, you oh, the, the short selling part is a question I've written down based on our last conversation. I'll get to that in a second, Jim. But um, the, back to the recession topic and the economy sort of faltering. I, I personally like looking at Dr. Copper as an indicator and then maybe the 10-year yield. And based on my own gut indicator, uh, 
you know, like towards the end of the year, last time we spoke, I, I was in the recession camp. I think things are going to get bad. Like we, we need to cut rates. Uh, it's not looking good. The recession is just around the corner. But then copper started turning around. The 10-year yield started to rise again. So there's no flight to safe haven investments. Um, what were some of the indicators you're looking at, Jim? Well, I assure you things are going to get bad. This is the longest period in American history without a serious economic problem. It has never happened before in American history. Maybe it's going to go on forever. Maybe we're never going to have economic problems again. We never have. So I can know it's going to come to an end. And as I said, you, I see the, pro the potential problems. I see a lot of exuberance, a lot of confidence in the markets. Everybody thinks this will go on forever. The central bank in the United States thinks they have solved the problem. They think they've got things under control. I mean, these guys are just bureaucrats and academics. They don't know what they're doing. But when they think they do, that is one sign that we're getting closer to the end. But I don't know. I mean, maybe we should watch you. You tell us when it's coming to an end. I don't know. But I know it is going to come to an end. I know that every country, nearly every country in the world right now is having good times. Whenever that has happened in the past, it was a time to get worried. No, better not listen to a YouTuber make predictions here. It's, uh, that's why we got the experts here for on this channel, Jim. But um, surprising, <laughs> surprising fact, I was just looking at the U.S. debt to GDP ratio. And of course, it, 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 it spiked up, it exploded back in 2020, but it has been coming down since. Despite massive money printing, despite massive deficits and deficit spending, over two trillion dollars a year, how, how do you explain that? Is the U.S. actually growing? Like, maybe I'm thinking maybe of new technologies that are being, you know, uh, leveraged. They, they have good accounting. They have good bookkeepers. You know, if you work for the government, you learn how to fake the books, and everybody around you is faking the books, so you fake the books too. I mean, America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. They can't fake that. They can try. They can cover it up, and they do cover it up. But facts are facts, and the debt goes higher every day, every hour. And this, throughout history, when something like this has happened, it has not ended well. I don't know when it's going to end, but I know it is going to end. As I say, I'm not selling short yet. I'm not very good at market timing anyway, but even if I did know what I was doing, I'm not selling short yet. Yeah, you mentioned that, and I'm glad you bring that up a second time, because I wrote down, like last time we spoke, the S&P 500 was about at 4,660 4, points, roughly. Um, now we're trading at over 5,300, and we've been higher before. You, you said you'd sell short once you see that blow off top. Like, where, where is that level for you? Like, give us a bit of a, a sentiment check here. I wish there were an easy answer to that. Oh my gosh, wouldn't we all be rich if we could just <laughs> figure out when the when it's going to peak? I'm not smart enough to know that. I'm not very good at market timing. I never have been. I know it's going to peak. I can see the signs. I can see the signs of exuberance. I can see the signs of lots of new investors coming in and calling up their friends and say, oh, I've discovered this new thing called the stock market and you can make money and it's easy. <laughs> You know, I've, we've seen this movie before. I don't know when it's going to end, though. As I said before, and I'll say again, I'm not very good at market timing. I know it's going to end, but I'm not there yet. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like there's still a lot of money flowing into it, but it's mostly ca carried by a number of stocks like NVIDIA. There's massive hype around NVIDIA still. We see the CEO of NVIDIA going to events, having to sign T-shirts, and uh, he's got rock star status these days. Like, isn't that a sign of a of a blow off top? Like that we're in a massive bubble. Well done. Well, you've noticed. Yes, that's a, one of the signs. These things happen towards the end of, towards the end of a bull market. Everybody's a rock star, and everybody wants to talk to them and get their T-shirt signed. I didn't know that part. Um, Maybe I should fly over and get a T-shirt signed or something as a memento of the last great bull market. But I don't see the end yet. But again, I am not good at market timing, so don't rely on me. During our last interview, you said the, the U.S. stock market usually does well in an election year. We're halfway through that election year. The stock market is doing well. We're at 5,300 points right now. Do, do you see that continuing? And do you see a massive drop-off come November 9th, maybe? 
Well, it often does markets, U.S. markets do fairly well during election years. It doesn't have to happen, needless to say. It is happening. It has happened. There's a lot of money around. We don't have serious inflation at the moment, at least according to the books that they publish. Um, I don't know when it's going to hit us. I repeat, I don't know when. I'm not good at this, but I would imagine that by the end of this year, or early next year, it will all come to an end. But let's ask you. <laughs> you you do this every week. You must have an answer. That, that is a good question because I see a lot of noise out there, Jim, and I'm still trying to filter it out. And I've been trending to lean towards more of geopolitics these days than any of the other micro indicators. Right. Um, you, you last our during our last conversation, we we're talking about trade wars in the Middle East and the Red Sea. I, I was been paying attention more to that and how that could disrupt overall like supply chain, but markets in in general. I think that's what I've been paying attention to. Well, what I'm more worried about is that is something accelerates somewhere. Yes, if it's just Hamas, it's not good. It's a disaster for the, for them and for us. But it's not World War Three. You know, if some one of these things could turn into gigantic war. I don't see that happening yet. But I do know that in history, when you have a lot of small wars, it often has a way to erupt into a bigger war. And if that happens, we're going to certainly have a serious bear market. Most markets don't like war. No, 100 percent. And uh, sadly, it's like again, I keep coming back to gold in that regard. Geopol geopolitically, like the gold price reacts to geopolitical events. And the question is, and I think we've discussed that last time as well, Jim, is like how geopolitical is the gold price? Because it is a flight to safety. When you see, you know, when the bombs are flying and the missiles are flying, you usually buy gold just to protect yourself. Like how much of that, of the gold, current gold price is is that factor, that geopolitical factor? Well, I've got some gold. I've <laughs> never sold any gold. I've been buying gold for many years. I never sold any. But... I'm an old peasant. I told you last time, I think, you know, when things go wrong, all of us old peasants want to have some gold in the closet. We want some silver under the bed because no matter what happens, we know that will help us. Well, it is a fantastic hedge. It, it, it surely is against uncertainty here. Uh, the question is, what do you do with it? Like, what are you protecting yourself from? Well, if there's serious chaos, you can't go down to the grocery store and buy bread or wheat or milk or anything unless you have something that the shopkeeper wants to take. If you walk in there with paper money, even from many countries, the shopkeeper is going to say, I'm sorry, Jim, I, I don't want your paper money right now. I need something more substantial. There is a crisis developing. But if there's a crisis, most people, border guards, shopkeepers, everybody, will take your gold or will take your silver. And by the way, I, I don't have bullion because if I go to the shopkeeper with a block of gold, he's going to say, well, it looks like gold, but how do I know, Jim? <laughs> Let's assay it. We don't have time for assaying it. That's why I prefer to say, you know, here's a U.S. silver dollar. Most people in the world would recognize it, and we don't have to assay it. And people usually don't have change for a big gold bar uh, as well. That would be You're my exactly problem. Exactly right. And even for coins, I mean, this is a U.S. silver dollar, but that's worth, you know, about 30 U.S. dollars, which is a lot for a loaf of bread. But at least maybe you can get a loaf of bread. You know, he won't send you away. No, they won't. They won't. And uh, coming from Germany, like we, we've seen it before. I still have the images in, in my head. Wheelbarrows full of cash just to buy a loaf of bread. We still have that. Well, especially like, those Germany, images they, are they all have. That's one of the first things they learn when they when they grow up in Germany about those wheelbarrows. So be sure you have a few things that you can use in the wheelbarrow. It's def deeply ingrained in our DNA. That's one of the reasons Germans love gold and gold mining stocks for that matter as well. <laughs> and they like sound money. They have, you know, when when I was a kid, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, German currency was the soundest in the world or one of the soundest in the world because the Germans had it beaten into their heads 
history had beaten it into their heads. We have to have sound money. Have you ever wondered, and just curious, and that's a really random question that popped in my head, if, if the Deutsche Mark would still exist today and not the euro, how, how strong would the Deutsche Mark be? Because we're extremely frugal uh, fiscally. Like we're not spending left, right, and crazy. Yes, we're running a small deficit here on the balance sheet, but our debt to GDP ratio is like 69 to 1 or 69 uh, percent or so. So it's not bad. Like, where would the Deutsche Mark be right now? Just curious, interesting thought exercise. Well, the Deutsche Mark would be one of the strongest currencies in Europe, if not the strongest. I mean, just look out the window. Most countries, Italy is not running a very sound shop, mm -hmm. as you know. Most countries, the, the British, oh, the British, running up staggering debts. Most of the countries in Europe keep running up staggering debts and printing a lot of money. So even if, I mean, if we did have the Deutsche Mark again, it would be stronger than most. Now, I tend to believe that as well. So same with the Swiss franc, although the Swiss franc will always trump us probably just because of its neutrality, um, I would assume. Well, that's when the Swiss franc does have some advantages. But, you know, right now the Swiss National Bank owns a lot of stocks, believe it or not. The Swiss franc is now backed by Apple, <laughs> backed by Microsoft. When Back when I was a kid, the Swiss franc was backed purely by gold real gold in a real vault where the Swiss could go in there and look at it if they had to. Now, believe it or not, the Swiss franc is backed by growth stocks, American growth stocks. It's not the way it was before. Doesn't sound very stable if you ask me, especially based on what we've been discussing, that you're eventually going to hit a wall and the valuations of these growth stocks, let's take Apple, Nvidia, are uh, off the charts anyway. Well, I assure you we're going to have a bear market again someday. I know that Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury in the U.S., says, don't worry, we've solved all these problems. Well, she's went to a couple of very nice Ivy League universities. I hope they've solved it, but I don't believe it for a minute. <laughs> how do you solve it? Like, how, how do you prevent a bear market? It'll always be a bear market. It's That's how a market works, isn't it? Like, <laughs> or am I getting something wrong here? No, no, of course you're not. For thousands of years, we've hundreds of years, decades, we've always had periodically had bear markets. If you can figure out a way to solve that problem, you can be Secretary of the Treasury in the US. You know, she said they've solved it. Nobody's solved it yet, ever in history. We would like to solve it, but I don't think human beings can solve that problem. We're all, we're all human beings and we all have those same weaknesses. Jim, you mentioned in our last interview that you haven't been adding to your stack of bull uh, bullion, meaning your coins and gold and silver exposure at all. Has that changed over the last six months? Uh, have, you, have you been adding? Have you been looking at it differently? Yes, I have bought more of mainly silver, but I bought I bought some more gold recently. Yes, yes. No, I periodically buy gold. And these days, silver is cheaper on a historic basis. So I have bought more silver than gold, but I bought some more of both. I, as I said to you before, I've never sold my gold. Uh, I've never sold any silver. I, it's my gold and silver is under my bed, and I hope that someday my children have my gold and silver. I hope they'll say, gosh, he must have been smart. Look at all this gold and silver. Now, uh, any, any potential trigger why you decided to, to go into the market and buy silver again, uh, for example? Well, it was down. I mean, silver was down over 50% a couple of weeks ago, and gold was making all-time highs. They don't have to move together, but they often have over the long term. So if gold is at an all-time high, it seems to me that silver is going to make an all-time too eventually. So it was just cheaper. So I bought some more silver. Let's talk about that, because silver was lagging gold quite a bit recently. Then it caught up. I think it was up 35%. Um, year, I think it was year-to-date, 35%. Gold was up about 20 to 25%. So it, it's been outpacing gold a little bit, but not based on historic averages. Usually the factor is like 3 to 1, where silver outpaces gold. Let's assume gold goes up 25%. Silver usually goes up 75%. Is that that lag and that price discount you've been talking about? Well, I look at a bigger picture than that. Gold today or yesterday is making an all-time high. Silver is still down nearly 40% from its all-time high. I'm looking at a much longer, a bigger picture, if you will. That does not mean I'm right. That does not mean 
this is going to turn out to be right, but that's my way of looking at the world and gold and silver. They, Jim, they don't every, necessarily move together, but they do move close together. Now, Jim, everything you say is, of course, gospel. So we're going to blindly follow you into what what, what you're doing. <laughs> no, no, fantastic. No, I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, you talked about agriculture last time as well, um, that you've been looking into that, and uh, you, you see that as a massively undervalued sector. Um, certain subsectors within that space have moved tremendously. Cocoa, for example. Coffee has been doing well. Um, where do we stand on agriculture? Well, it's the same as what I said before. Agriculture is depressed on a historic basis. You know, nobody wants to be a farmer anymore. Nobody goes to university and studies agriculture these days. You know, the average age of farmers in America is over 50 years old. In some countries, it's over it, higher than that even. You know, in Japan, the average age of farmers is 66 or something. World's going to run out of farmers eventually unless something happens. But I will tell you what has always happened in the past is when things get really bad, nobody becomes a farmer. Farms lag. There's no production. So the price of agricultural prices go through the roof. Then young kids see farmers driving Mercedes and Lamborghinis. And so they become farmers. And the cycle turn goes over again. If everybody's rich, it was a farmer, people want to be farmers. It seems like policies or global policies are against farming these days as well. Wherever you look, there's farmers protesting against government policies as well. So nothing is going for the farmers right now. Well, no, it has not been very good to be a farmer in many countries uh, in the past few years. Look at Japan. They're all dying out uh, for many reasons. They're dying out. But Look at, pick any country you want. And it is not, you don't see lots of people rushing to be farmers because it has not been a great place to buy. You're not going to buy a Lamborghini, probably. Your son might buy a Lamborghini if, if you become a farmer. But no, farming has not been great. Yeah, you're not talking this about time. the tractor, by the way, right? You're talking about the sports car Lamborghini, not the tractor Lamborghini. Well, Lamborghini started as a tractor company, you know, and, and Mr. Lamborghini went to Mr. Ferrari at one point and said, I want to buy you off of one of your Ferraris. And Mr. Ferrari said, I don't sell my cars to farmers, to tractor, to tractor drivers. So Mr. Lamborghini went and started making cars <laughs> because he couldn't buy one. But, you know, they looked down on him. Now, they don't, they don't look down on him anymore, but for a while... Who wants a Lamborghini? That's a tractor. Now we know better. Uh, fun, fun cars to look at, I'll tell you that. Like, I've never driven one, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man, right? I, I guess I'm attracted to sports cars. It's uh, it's in our DNA. It's in my DNA, at least. So, um, Jim, back to back to the market discussion. I always like getting sidetracked with you. It's fun to chat. Um, but uh, little, where, where do you see opportunities in this market right now? Um, or let's call it like opportunities, maybe opportunities with the least amount of risk. Like we talked agriculture. Um, are there any other market segments that you look at? Well, we've talked about agriculture. Most stock markets are, have, are up or near all time highs. China's not. China's one of the few markets that down for a variety of reasons. So I have been looking at, at China. I own Chinese shares, but I would like to buy more if I can find something. Uh, Russia, of course, is a, a market that's attractive. I cannot buy Russia because I'm an American and that's war. But if you find a place like that, you might find opportunities. Jim, I got to ask you, since you're based in Singapore, I'm curious, like, what do the headlines look like in the papers these days? Like I spoke again, bringing up Simon Hunt here, but he said that the headlines in, in Chinese paper, newspapers, for example, have gotten very aggressive and clear towards Taiwan, for example. Like what, what I'm obviously biased here being in Germany by Western media. Like, what does it look like in Singapore, um, the news? Like, what's the mix there? Well, we just had a big defense military conference here where all the, I'm going to say Western countries, but they're not just Western. I mean, many, many countries gather in Singapore every year. They call it the, I think they call it the Shangri-La Conference. They all get together and talk about how to spend more money on war, on guns. And they just met in Singapore recently. And 
And of course, most of them act like China, some kind of horrible threat, some kind of horrible danger. That's what happened again. And unfortunately, as long as they keep talking that way, if they keep, you know, if you keep poking a country in the eye, eventually something might happen. And they're still poking China in the air, in the eye. And that, that is what you're seeing in financial media represent because you, you don't hear that much. Like I keep looking at like the financial media, like it's the, the narrative is always against Russia, of course, here. But I'm just curious what the media landscape looks like, what they're focusing on. It's, it's, I'm assuming it's more China heavy. Well, I'm not suggesting that they're all pulling out rifles and guns <laughs> and saying, let's blow up China today. But if they're talking about somebody at this conference, this Shanghai, uh, Shangri-La conference, uh, they talk about China. As though China, some, I mean, China comes to the conference. China says, no, don't worry, we're not a threat. But they all talk about it. Well, they got to talk about somebody, got to keep their jobs. They got to spend more money. You know, the American Secretary of Defense wants to spend more money. Got to talk about somebody. <laughs> he, he can't talk about Portugal. So China's an obvious target. I, I shouldn't be quoting from Marvel movies, Jim, but uh, I think it was Captain America said that America needs a common enemy so they can unite behind, the, like behind the you know the face. They they need to they need a common enemy to be united, all right. And that's what it seems like to me. Russia at first, and now we're adding China to the mix. We do need a common enemy so that we all can pull on one string. Like, would you agree with that? Well, uh, what do I agree with? I can look out the window. No, it's correct. It's a correct <laughs> statement. You can read newspapers. You can watch TV. This is happening all the time. Uh, America, since 19, uh, since 1776, America, when America was founded, America has been at war nearly every year except for 19 years. People in Washington seem to like war. I don't. And we're not very good at it recently. But America wants war. No, no, somebody, in, somebody in Washington wants war. Not me, but somebody seems to want war. It's astonishing. Like J Jim, we got to sort of put put a bow around it all. Like we we, we got half a year ahead of us. Let's let's predict. Try predicting the markets a little bit until year end. Um, where, where do you see things headed? We we talked about the U.S. being in an election year. Um, but the market seems stagnant right now. It's like it's, it's hit its tops at 54, 5,500 in the S&P 500. Um, it, it's come off since. Like, do, do you see another, you know, leg higher coming or are we just sort of treading water until the U.S. elections are over? Well, I am not selling short yet. So if it's peaked, I, I've missed it. Um, but I am waiting. I have a lot of cash. My next move, will, I hope, will be to sell short. If there's, the, the market continues strong and there are opportunities, I cannot imagine that I would buy shares again, and certainly not the U.S., not the way things are now. And my, I presume that my next move will be to sell short if and when there's more strength. But, but again, I don't know. I'm not a market timer. No, the market will tell us, obviously. Like We, we, we can just look at the charts and then uh, we, we make that decision. But Jim, I really appreciate your time. It's getting late in Singapore and uh, I always appreciate chatting with you. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. Can't wait for our next update in about four months or so. We'll, we'll see where we're at, a bit, bit closer to the U.S. elections. We'll see where the market stands and uh, and. Uh, Appreciate your time. Like I know you don't have anything to sell, so usually my last question is, and it's muscle memory. I almost ask is like, where can we find more of your work? But uh, you, you have nothing to sell. <laughs> I don't have anything to sell, but, and I got to get to the disco. So. Okay, there you go. It's uh, ten p.m. There you go. Too much longer. <laughs> no, Jim, I won't get minutes. into the disco unless I get there. Ah, uh, phenomenal. Yep. Appreciate it. No, it'll be fun. You'll, you'll have a blast. Jim, thank you so much for your time and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. Tremendously appreciate chatting with Jim Rogers here again and uh, catching up with him. See where we're at in the markets and uh, we still have a ways to go till the U.S. election. Let's see when we hit that blow off top. Like we've lost a bit of steam in the markets. So I'm curious where things are headed the next six months. I think the current president is doing everything he can, stimulating the economy to get reelected. That's what I'm seeing right now. That's my gut feeling. That's what I'm seeing in the headlines. Curious where this takes the market. If you like this conversation, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and leave a comment. We do want to hear from you. What do you think of this conversation? And uh, we'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially. Thank you so much for tuning in and talk soon.